Saved by the Blood, the choir will join you on the first verse. We'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth verse, page 227. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I say that because if you're not awake, he'll wake you up. Amen. Right? They used to do something in camp where if the kids seemed a little sleepy, they'd have a, a, a word, right? And that word, every time they said that word, what the kids would do is stand up, grab their stuff, and go to the opposite side of the sanctuary. Okay? So unless you want that this morning, all right, hold your eyelids open and do whatever you got to do. Stretch or get slapped on the back of the head, whatever. But uh, be ready for church this morning. Amen. So glad to see you. A few things to walk through quickly, and then we'll take our offering and move along with our service. Of course, Brother Kent York and his wife Julie are here with us this morning. We're so glad to uh, to have them, a wonderful, bold man of God. And so we're, we're anxious to hear uh, the word. Uh, so be praying, and uh, I pray that, uh, again, you've got maybe some watching online or whatever it is. I'll tell you this, though. This morning's services will be online. So maybe if you had a guest or somebody who could not come or maybe was hoping to come and could not attend, Make sure that they go to the church's Facebook page and they can still watch the live stream from today. Okay, and so that is one big blessing. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us uh, to put that online. And so, again, they're able to access that after the service today. Okay, so that's just a small tidbit. Uh, just a, a few announcements coming up here for you. 
Uh, we're going to do, uh, again, our Saturday morning outreach as we do every week. Um, I know that there were some that were asking uh, uh, times and different things, just some that had some new interest in it. And so I know I announce it often, but I want to keep going over what we're doing and what we're trying to do. Uh, again, Saturday morning, starting at 9 o'clock, we, uh, we have a coffee and donut time, and then we do a devotion. And after that devotion time is over, we go out and we knock some doors. I'll say this, I was encouraged just the other day as I was going through what I've got is I've got a little binder in my office, and it has all the different neighborhoods that we've knocked. And I'll tell you this, around us, listen to this, listen to what a blessing this is. We are running out of neighborhoods that we have not gone and knocked. What a, what a praise, amen, amen, to go through and look at some of those big housing developments that we've knocked. That's a wonderful praise. And so, again, thank you for being a part of that and all that you've done. But I'll say this, there's lots of doors to be knocked, amen. There's lots of souls yet to be reached. I know this, there's there's two big housing developments being uh, built right now and some new people. And so uh, we're going to keep going. And, and I'll tell you this, just the small uh, amount of people that we've had over the past that have gone and done that, have accomplished that much work. And if you would come and, and lend your hand and lend your body, I'm telling you, the Lord could use it. Uh, the Lord has always worked in miraculous ways when it comes to outreach. I remember just quickly, as I know we're uh, pressed on time this morning, but I remember this, COVID had... Uh, just kind of gotten serious and we were debating what to do. Uh, can we still go out and uh, reach souls? Can we still go door knock or what does it need to look like? You know, some of these different things. And uh, as a pastor with not very much experience, I began to pray and I could not get away from the notion that God wanted us to go out. And so what did we do? We went out, right? Amen. And we went out and we prayed and asked the Lord to protect. Amen. Number one. And uh, number two, to, to, you know, bring fruit there. And I'll tell you this, we've got one, two, uh, Family is with us this morning. I'm looking for the third. We've got two of them here this morning that we went out and reached just Amen. in that month. Amen. Amen. So Amen. that's a that's a praise right there. And I'll tell you what, we need to keep doing it. There's still souls that need to be saved. And I, I'll tell you this: if you're not comfortable with it, listen, get comfortable with it. Amen. Get comfortable. Get in it and do it, and you'll get comfortable with it. It's the best thing that you can do. I'll say this on that uh, side note: we do have some phone calls and different things that you can do if you're somebody who doesn't go out for whatever reason. Maybe your health doesn't permit you to go out and knock doors, whatever it is, we've got some different phone calls and we're even gonna start writing our missionaries. And so we've got some different opportunities for you to be there with us on that Saturday morning, okay? So just wanted to, uh, again, make some of those announcements. If our ushers will come, we'll wait for the offering. I'll make this announcement too. Brother Kent has a uh, table out front with some different t-shirts and hats and different things that, uh, again, go towards helping the ministry. And, and again, I know uh, with COVID, there, there's, I, I can only imagine, I've not talked to him personally about some of this, but I know that there's probably a financial burden there, just as there is almost everywhere. And so again, all of those different things go to help that ministry. And if you would be so generous to stop out and, and grab something, and they're good looking stuff, so grab something and uh, maybe help that ministry out just a little bit. So let's do this, let's pray, and we'll take up our offering. Lord, need you this morning and love you. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd be with us today. I pray, God, that your spirit would fill this place. I pray, Lord, that you'd get a hold of every heart. Pray, God, that uh, no matter what happens here this morning, that this could be said, that you got the honor and you got the glory, Lord, and we're trying to build your kingdom. So, God, we're praying, again, that we be able to point all those things towards you. Lord, as we look at our church and we look at growth and we see souls have been saved and folks have been baptized, uh, Lord, we don't accredit that to any person. We don't give that to a man. We don't give that to a woman. We give that solely to you. And so, God, praise you, and we want to praise you as a church this morning for keeping our doors open. For those that have been added to the church, and, and again, the Lord, uh, I'm sorry, the body that you see here today, Lord, that has gathered, uh, we, we point that all to you. We want to give you honor and glory. So, Lord, have your will in your way with your people. Uh, we pray, Lord, for this offering. We pray that you would uh, make it go as far as it can go for your cause. Lord, we know that we have big dreams and big visions of what we'd like to do to be able to better reach our world. And so, God, we just pray that you, again, would be with your finances. And, Lord, we pray, again, that you would be administering your work all around this world and help us to be a part of it. So we love you this morning. Pray that you'd be with us, please. In Jesus' holy, precious, wonderful, powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Every time I try to make it on my own, every time I try to stand, I start to fall. And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on, there was Jesus. When the life I built came crashing to the ground, Friends I had were nowhere to be found. I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now. Well, there was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been or where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kind of grace, for forgiveness and a price I couldn't pay. I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, Of the alleys, there was Jesus in the fire, in the flood. There was Jesus, always is and always was. page 200. We're going to sing He's a Wonderful Savior to Me. We'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth verse. Page 200. <laughs> Oh, 
Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. On the last, he grows the love of Jesus every day. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Sweeter is his grace while resting on my way. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For he's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took He's a wonderful Savior to me. Thank you. Please be seated. Just 
disappointment for the aching of this life. Yes, I reveal it now the greatest thirst this world can't satisfy. What if trials of this life? The rains, the storms, the hardest part are your mercies in Ran off with my microphone. Sorry about that. He didn't want to hear me talk. Well, I tell you this much. Um, I was a young preacher boy at Marysville and uh, just learning and some of those different things. And I believe uh, when I got saved, Brother King York was actually the first revival speaker I had ever heard in my entire life. I had not been in church my life. And so I got saved at the age of 16. And I believe, as I recall, that was the first one I was ever a part of. And so Brother Kent York has been a good, I know he, he's not, I've been on staff at some of the churches he's been to. I've not had a, all the time in the world to have a, a relationship with him, but I look forward to the future and getting to know him even more. But uh, he's had a wonderful part of my life, and even though, uh, again, I was just on staff, but uh, he's had a wonderful part of my ministry, and, and again, I, I thank him for doing what he does. And so this morning, uh, he's going to come and share, and I'll give him just a time to introduce uh, himself and his wife and just tell you a little bit about their ministry. So thank you, Brother Kent York. Amen. Thank you, Brother Austin. Well, are you glad to be here? Say amen. Amen. Now look over at the person next to you and just say, my, you're good looking. <laughs> now don't just laugh your head off after you say it like you didn't mean it. <laughs> we are honored to be here at Victory Baptist, and we have known your pastor for many years since he was just a boy, and we are so proud of him and the work that God has called him and Amanda to do here. And uh, and she's over here just about ready to bust. And, <laughs> and, uh, I am so happy how God has blessed their family and blessed this church with a good pastor that you have. And you, you need to love him and be good to him because they're not out there a dime a dozen today. It's hard Amen. to find someone that will truly preach the gospel right. of Jesus Christ. And I know you've got that. My name is Kent York. I am an evangelist. Uh, uh, we are now in our 22nd year as an itinerant evangelist. Before that, I pastored three churches over an 18-year period. I, my first church was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And then I pastored in Border, Texas. And my last church was just south of Branson, Missouri. And, uh, but for the last eight, uh, 22 years, we've crisscrossed the, the world, really. We've been around the world 18 times in the last 22 years. And guess what? All roads led to Batavia, Ohio. Isn't that amazing? And it brought us right here today. And we are honored to be here and look forward to the day. Uh, in fact, me and the pastor sat down before the service and we penciled in a date for a revival later this year. And so maybe we can come back and do a full-blown meeting later in the year. But today we're just here for one Sunday morning and thank you for having me in. Me and Julie both will be back at our table afterwards. Please stop by and shake hands and say hi. And uh, we do have stuff back there that we uh, sell to help us go to the mission field every year. And right now I'm scheduled to go to Mexico this year. We were scheduled to go to Ghana, West Africa last year, but that was all canceled because of the COVID. And we're praying it's all going to dry up and clear up and we can get back to traveling around the world. But when we go to the mission field, we go at no expense to the missionaries at all. We pay for all the expenses. I pick up all the checks at the restaurants, hotel bills, plane tickets, 
If I stay in the missionary's home, I even buy their groceries while I'm there. And last one, I was in Costa Rica not long ago, and I even bought the dog food for their dumb dog. <laughs> And so we pay for everything. When I go to the mission field, I want that missionary to say, Brother Kent and Julie did not cost us one red cent. And they came, and we preach meetings, people get saved, and uh, it's a great blessing. And the way you can help me is pick up one of them crazy shirts or hats and... Uh, uh, I'm going to run a special this morning because I love you people. If you buy one shirt, you have to buy three, all right? So uh, uh, come on back. Well, it's special for the missionaries. And uh, uh, I do use credit cards, and you can write a check, and I have a little change if you need it. But me and Julie will be back there, and then we'll pack it all up, and we're out of here. But uh, if you could be a blessing, that would be wonderful. Get your Bibles out this morning. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter number 12. Luke, chapter number 12. We're going to start reading in verse number 16. When you find your place in God's Word, let's stand and we'll honor the Bible as we read it by standing. Luke, chapter number 12. Look at verse 16. The Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, Now the he here, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is about to give us a parable. A parable is an earthly story, but it most definitely has a heavenly meaning. A parable is a story. I had a preacher the other day, Brother Austin. I think he was trying to hurt my feelings. He said, Brother Kent, you're a skyscraper preacher. I said, well, thank you. What does that mean? He said, your story on top of story on top of story. And I think he was trying to hurt my feelings, but it didn't hurt my feelings because Jesus was a storyteller because he found that people cannot understand the deep truths of the kingdom of God unless you illustrate it with an earthly story. And today we're going to look at one of his greatest parables. It says in verse number 16, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, here it goes, soul, kind of weird. <laughs> Thou hast much goods laid up for many, Years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you today that we live in a country like the United States of America where we can freely handle, read, and preach from this Bible. Dear God, I'm thankful for young men and young women, some of them on the other side of this planet this morning, in towns that we can't even pronounce. And they're protecting this freedom. Please be with our service people today and bless them and let them know we love them. Dear God, we ask you to take the reading of your word and the preaching of your word and bless it. I'm praying for somebody in this room today it's one heartbeat from going into eternity without Jesus. 
They've never made Jesus their leader. They've never made him king. They've never made him Lord. I pray today they'd listen as never before. And at the close of this message, when I hold the altar call, they'd come forward and say, I want to be saved. Dear Lord, I pray for Christians today that need a touch from you. I pray their hearts would be open and receptive to the preaching. Dear God, we give you the next few moments. You take them, you bless them. And whatever you do, however you do it, we're going to be very, very careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and Lord we will give you every bit of the glory we pray in Jesus name Amen thank you you may be seated this morning we see Jesus and he takes a paintbrush and he paints us a portrait. Did you see it? He painted us a portrait of a fool. <laughs> a fool. Now, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm not in the habit of calling people fool. Have you ever met people and they'll call other people a fool? I, you know, the Bible actually says, call no man a fool. But I just kind of believe that if God called this man a fool, he probably was a fool. Mm -hmm. Now, in my life, I'm very, very sure there's been times when I have met a fool. Have you ever just met a fool and you walked away and said, you know, I just met a fool. Mm -hmm. I fly all the time. I'm at the airport all the time. And you go up to that counter and sometimes you put your luggage up on those scales at the counter and that flight... Uh, clerk there will look at you and they'll push them buttons a hundred times and then every once in a while one of them will look at you and say, sir, has anybody put anything in your luggage without your knowledge? <laughs> hmm. You know, if it was without my knowledge, how would I know? <laughs> Are you a fool? I remember I went to the department store to buy something for Christmas and I rang the item up and I gave the girl my credit card and signed the slip and when she got the slip, she took my card in that slip and she flipped it over and she looked at me and said, sir, I cannot accept your credit card. I said, why not? She said, you didn't sign the card on the back. I said, okay, give it here. Let me sign it. She handed it to me. I signed it. I handed it back to her. You know what she did? She compared the signatures. <laughs> I just signed both of them in front of you. Of course they match. Are you a fool? So there's times when you meet people and you wonder, is that a fool? And then, uh, I don't know if you're like me, there's been many a time you feel like a fool. You ever just feel like a fool? TSA came out with a new machine called the Full Body Scanner. And uh, you step into this phone booth and uh, you put your feet on these two white feet or yellow feet there. And then this thing learning the gigs around you and, and it burns all your clothes off of you. And uh, they just see your neck and body. And uh, first time I ever saw one of them, boy, I was down in Gulfport, Mississippi, and I saw it and I thought, ooh, I do not want to go through that thing. No, I am going to avoid that. And so I just kept my head down, and I kept going down that conveyor belt, and I and they had a metal detector, and all of a sudden I heard the fellow say, Sir, sir, we got a new machine over here, and we want you to try it. And I said, Oh, no, that's all right. I'll just go through the metal detector. And they're like, Oh, no, no, we won't try it. you got to come over here. I got in that machine and put my feet on those two footprints. And you got to put your hands up and it whirled around me. And then you got to step out. And there was a guy standing right there and he had an earpiece and a wire running down his collar. And he said, stand right there. So, boy, I stood right there. And I, all of a sudden I heard him go, what? You want me to do what? Are you sure? <laughs> 
And he turned and got right in my face and he said, Sir, I'm going to have to touch you in some private areas. I said, really? He said, if you would like to, we go to the back room and do it. I said, I'm not going to no back room with you. <laughs> you going to do it. We're going to do it out here in public. <laughs> I ain't going to no back room. And I mean, he began to poke me and to punch me. I don't know what he was looking for. I think he thought this was all plastic explosives draped on me. <laughs> He punched every bit of blubber I had. And when I walked away, I felt like a fool. You know what? I've met fools. I've felt like a fool. But this morning, we get to actually meet a bona fide fool. So let's look at the fool this morning. First off, I want you to notice that this man was a fool about his person. Did you know that there is no mention in this parable at all of any family? There's no mention of any neighbors. There's no mention of any friends. It's all about him. In fact, in three verses, he refers to himself, either with a noun or a pronoun, 11 different times. Did you see it? My crops, my barns, I will do this, I will do that. Here is a man that worshipped at the altar of himself. Everything in life revolved around him. There's a few like that in this room this morning. You can't even sit here and listen to this sermon. You know why? You're already worried about what you're going to eat for lunch. You're already worried about what's on television this afternoon. You're already worried about what you're going to do at work tomorrow. You know why? Because your life is all about you. Everything revolves around you. And I'm going to tell you right now, you need to realize that you're not the center of the world. Yes, you're important to God. You were important enough that he sent his only begotten son to die for you on a cross. But you need to realize you are not the creator. You are the created. It's not all about you. Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. You know what that verse means? Don't esteem yourself over much. Don't be arrogant. Williams translated that verse and actually said, don't estimate yourself above your real value. Mm -hmm. You see, there's a lot of people today, just like this fool, that live a self-centered life. When I was a student at Baptist Bible College years ago, Brother Austin, they didn't allow us to have televisions in the dormitory. They thought we should just pray and meditate all the time. But it was one of the final games of the NBA playoffs. And we had to see that game. It was the Boston Celtics against the LA Lakers. It was being played in LA, so the game was very late at night. So we went out and found us a 13 inch TV set. We put it in a cardboard box and we carried it into the dorm. We put it in our closet and cut a flap. It's late, late at night, and we're down there in our dorm room, and we're watching that Lakers-Celtic game. Oh, it got down to five seconds left in the game. The Celtics were ahead by one point. The Lakers would get the ball. There would be five seconds left. Nobody in the world had any doubt who would get the ball. Everybody knew who they would inbound the ball to. The greatest Laker that ever lived, Kareem Abdul. Jabbar. Now for you kids, that's not a football player, that's a basketball player. His name was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And sure enough, they inbounded the ball to Kareem. He dropped
dribbled just a couple of steps to the top of the key. He flipped that ball in the air. It was arching in the air and right at the top of the arch. Nah! The buzzer went off. And the ball fell. And went swish all net right through the middle of the goal. Ah! We're jumping on the bed. We're screaming. We're yelling. People are running on the basketball court. And all of a sudden our door opens. And it's our floor mom. He says, you guys got a TV in here. You're in big trouble. And he closed the door. He said, as soon as the post game show is over. And he sat down on the end of the bed with us. And I mean, people were screaming and yelling and running. And a reporter with a camera ran out on the court and he stuck the mic in Kareem's face and said, Kareem, you've just made one of the greatest shots in the history of the NBA. What do you have to say? And I've thought since then what he could have said. Could have said, well, I'd like to thank God for making me almost seven foot tall because that really helped. I'd like to thank my mom and dad for raising me. I'd like to thank my coaches in junior high, high school, college, and professional. I'd like to thank my teammates because they blocked everybody out so I could make that shot. I thought many times of all the things he could have said, but I'll never forget Kareem looked in that camera and said, what can I say? Just like I'm the greatest. And I thought, Kareem, there at the greatest moment of your NBA career, you were standing on the shoulders of thousands of people that got you to that point in your life, and you took all the credit. And I tell you this morning, I don't care who you are, I don't care where you are, you're standing on the shoulders of other people that got you to where you are in life. <laughs> Have you ever driven down one of these Ohio country roads and seen a turtle sitting on top of a fence post? Uh -huh. I guarantee you he didn't get there by himself. And you did not get where you are in life by yourself. Don't be arrogant. This man was a fool about his person. And second of knowing your person is understanding what you got. This man was a fool about his possessions. Did you notice his crops were so abundant he had to build bigger barns? Now, bigger barns does not always bring happiness. In fact, you have to understand the possessions you have in life God gave them to you. And we live in a world today where in our culture, there's really three philosophies of possessions. First, there's what I would call the pagan philosophy. Mm -hmm. The pagan philosophy says this, I want what you've got and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it. That is the philosophy of the criminal. Mm -hmm. That is the philosophy of the crooked politician. They don't care how they get your money. They just want to get it. That is the philosophy of the pornographer today. One of the leading pornographers on the internet was interviewed and they asked him, does it bother you that the pornography you put out on the internet, does it bother you that it degrades women? Does it bother you that it desensitizes young men? in their marriages? Does it bother you that that porn that you peddle on the internet hurts people? And you know what he said? He said, pornography puts food on my family's table and a roof over our head. You see, he didn't care how he got your money. He didn't care what damage it does. He just wants your money. That is a pagan philosophy of possession. And then secondly, there's what I would call the perverted philosophy. 
And I'm sorry to say, this is going to be the most highly held one in this room this morning. A perverted philosophy. It's not, I'm going to take what is yours, but it's the philosophy of it's mine, I've earned it, and it's all mine. I'm going to get all I can, and I'm going to can all I get. Mm -hmm. I worked for it. It's my money. It's all mine. That's the reason today we have stingy people who don't understand the grace of giving. In fact, you've got some right here in this church. I'm sure, Brother Austin, every church does. There's some of you this morning. You're so tight and stingy. You get up in the morning. You screw your britches on with a screwdriver. Because you don't understand the joy of giving. You just believe in, I'll build bigger barns. I'll have bigger bank accounts. I'll buy bigger houses. I'll drive better cars. You don't understand the joy of sharing and giving. And let me just say this right now. Don't go out of here and say, Brother Kent's a communist, because I'm not. I'm a capitalist through and through. But I don't believe that the government ought to tell me who I'm going to give to. I think you should be a giver, but I think you should do that out of a heart of love. And not because the government makes you do it. You see, it's a perverted philosophy when you are going to hold on to everything you've got. And then thirdly, there's what I would call the proper philosophy. I hope that some of you have learned the joy of the proper philosophy. The proper <coughs> philosophy is very simple. <laughs> everything I've got, God gave it to me. Everything I've got is his. And if he needs me to give it away, I'll give it away. If he needs me to use it, I'll use it. I had a preacher friend and they had a family in the church. They had a job, but they didn't have a car, so they couldn't get to work. So the preacher got in the pulpit, and he said, Hey, folks, we need to start praying for this family. They, they don't have a car, and we need to, we, we need to pray that God will give them a car. The preacher said, I didn't know that God wanted them to have my car. <laughs> and that preacher gave that family his car, almost a new car. He gave it to them. And I asked the preacher, I said, Preacher, how do you give away a new car? How do you do that? And you know what he said? He said, it only hurts if you love it. <laughs> you know, that's the way possessions are. That's how money is. It only hurts if you love it. That's the reason the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. He didn't say money is evil. He says the love of it is evil. You see, this man was a fool about what he had. God had blessed him. God had given him so much. But instead of giving it away, instead of sharing it, instead of being generous, he just built bigger barns. He was a fool. And then thirdly, he was a fool about his pleasures. Now go to that weird verse, what I call the weird verse, verse 19. And I call it the weird verse because he's talking to his own soul. Mm. Not only does he talk to his soul, but he answers his own soul. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, here it is, soul, <laughs> thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine easy, drink, and be merry. You notice that last phrase in that verse that kind of encapsulates what everybody calls having a good time is. Let's eat. Let's drink. Let's be merry. He was a fool about his pleasures. Now let's take it apart. Eat. Well, isn't food a good friend? Isn't food comforting? In fact, a couple of you right now are going, yeah, but you shut up, I'll go eat something. <laughs> you know, 
food's a good friend. Food's a blessing. Some of you ladies that are here, do you ever get a little depressed, a little discouraged, and you're out driving and you see that speedway station and you know it's got a mini mark in there and you know there's a good friend that lives in that mini mark. He lives in there. You know who he is? Mr. Ho-Ho. <laughs> And you go in there and those ho-hos, you ever notice they come in a two-pack? It's always a two-pack. Never get a single ho-ho. It's a double ho-ho. And you carry it up to the counter and lay it down. And the guy doing the checkout will look at you kind of like, you're going to eat that? And you're like, ah, my kids like those in their sack lunches. I would never dream of eating one. And then you go out and get in your car and pull over to the corner of the parking lot. Put up your tinted window. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Holt. <laughs> now, why does everybody look at me like I'm the only one that ever did that? <laughs> Bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> you know, food. It can satisfy you. It can satisfy the flesh. He says, I'm going to eat, and then I'm going to drink. Now, this, this is not a reference to water. He's not just thirsty. I'm going to get me a big old glass of ice water. No, this is a direct reference to an intoxicating beverage. He's going to drink something. He's going to drink something that will change his thinking that will manipulate his mind. And you know, I've dealt with alcoholics all my ministry, and I will tell you, everyone I've ever dealt with, they drink for one reason. They're trying to drown their problems. And I got news for you, listen to me. Your problems know how to swim. Mm -hmm. It can't be done. You young people that are here, listen to me. Listen good. Bud does not make you wiser. <laughs> it makes you stupider. Think about it for a minute. Who would go down to Walmart Supercenter and buy a 24 cube of Pepsi and sit down and drink every one of them watching a football game? You're like, oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah, but how many people will sit down and drink a 24 cube of beer? While they're watching it. I mean, you can't tell me you're thirsty. You can't tell me it tastes good. Some some alcoholic products, they taste like battery acid. You're trying to affect your mind. He said, I'm going to drink something. I'm going to eat. I'm going to drink. And then the last part of that verse 19 says, and be merry or make merriment. Study the word make merriment in the original language. The root meaning is of a sexual context. I'm going to satisfy my sexual desires. Now, I don't know about you, but does this kind of sound like what we call partying hardy? Huh? I'm going to get me some chicken wings and some pizza. I'm going to get me a couple of six packs. I'm going to get my girlfriend, get my boyfriend, and we're going to party down. Yeah. That's exactly what the world calls having a good time. And Jesus says, God called this man a fool. And I'll tell you this morning, you're as big as fool as this guy is if that's how you derive your joy in life. Whether it be eating, drinking, making merriment, or maybe some of, maybe it's hunting. 
Maybe it's playing golf. Maybe it's doing hobbies or going garage selling. You see, the point is this. And I'm not against I'm not against any of that. I'm definitely not against any. But you know what? If anything takes the place of God in your life, in other words, if, if the joy of the Lord is not going out and knocking some doors and inviting people to the Lord, the joy of the Lord is not reading the Bible or praying or living a godly life or furthering the work of Christ. If you derive, derive your joy from something else, you're a fool! This man was a fool about his pleasures. And then lastly, and I'm done, Look at verse 19. I read over it pretty quickly. He's talking to his soul, and he says, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. I want to tell you first that this man was a fool about his predictions. Did you see that? He said, I've got all this stuff, and I'm going to enjoy it. For many years, meaning I'm going to live a long time. And the truth be told, he would not wake up the next morning. He would die that night. He was a fool about his predictions. It always amazes me around the church. We've got, we've got boys that are 14, 15 years old. And we've got men that are 95 years old. If you talk to both of them, no one's dying tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You're 15 years old. How long are you going to live? Well, I'm going to live at least to be 100. And with modern medicine, you might live to be 100. Then you can talk to a little old gentleman, 95 years old. How long are you going to live, sir? Well, I'm still a kicking. I'm not dying tomorrow. The only problem is somebody's dying tomorrow. Young people die. Old people die. The Bible says our life is but a vapor. We have no guarantee of a long life. But we all think we're going to live forever. And this guy said, for many years, for many years, I'm going to enjoy all these goods. And that night, he would die. He was a fool. My number two son, Ben, pastors up in Hilliard, outside of Columbus. Several years ago, he was our youth pastor at our church in Oklahoma. Ben used to like to take the teens out on Monday night and go door knocking. He thought it was good for teenagers to knock doors. So they'd go door knocking. It was late in August. Ben had a teenage boy with him, and they walked up on a porch and knocked on the door. And a big old strapping boy came to the front porch. Ben said, Dad, he was a head taller than me. Ben began to talk to him about his soul and found out very quickly his name was Cody and that Cody was not saved. And then Ben told me, Dad, this boy was brutally honest. Brutally honest. He leaned into the screen door and said, Sir, I don't have time for you. This Friday night, I'm starting on the football team. I'm a senior in high school. I've got my schoolwork. I've got my friends. I've got my football twice a day practices. I don't have time for you. And Ben said, well, Cody, I know you're busy, but if you just give me a moment, I could be happy to show you how you could accept the Lord right now. You could be saved. He said, sir, did you hear me? I don't have time for you. And if I ever go to church, I might go someday with my mother, but I'm not coming to your church. He wouldn't listen to Ben. And Ben and that other teenage boy walked off the porch at about 6.20 Monday afternoon. Wednesday, 
Cody went to school. They were doing two-a-day practices. It was August. The first practice in the morning, he felt kind of nauseated and sick. But he went on to school. And then that afternoon, during the second practice, he still didn't feel good. And Cody collapsed on the practice field. He didn't lose consciousness, but our coach was concerned enough. He didn't call an ambulance. And they took him to our little local hospital. They didn't know what was the matter with him. His white blood count was high. He was nauseated. He was running a slight fever. They called his mother, who was a beauty operator, and she closed her chair down. And she came to the hospital, and they put her and Cody in an ambulance. And they sent him on up to Children's Hospital in Oklahoma City. Friday night came, and Cody didn't get to start the football game because he was still in the hospital. In fact, he stayed in the hospital all weekend. And to everybody's shock, every day Cody was in the hospital, he didn't get better. He got worse. And at 4.30, Wednesday afternoon, Cody died. 17 years old. A big, strapping football player. You see, when he stood on the porch with my son Ben, he said he didn't have time find out about Jesus because he was too busy and he could go someday with his mother. <clears throat> to our knowledge, Cody never did get saved. Cody was a fool because I believe God sent my son to that porch that night to give that young man one more chance. But he was a fool. And this man was a fool when he thought he had many years. And God said, thou fool, tonight your soul shall be required of thee. And I say to you this morning, I don't think God sent an evangelist from Chickasha, Oklahoma, all the way up a country road in Batavia, Ohio, as a mistake today. This is a divine appointment for you and me both. Because you need to hear this message. Because you need to be saved. And if you walk out those double doors and go get in your car and pull off of this property, I'm going to tell you this, you're as big a fool as this man. Because today I've told you the truth. Jesus Christ loved you. He died on an old rugged cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says that if you would just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, thou shalt be saved. Or you can walk out of here gambling that I got more time. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool today. Be wise. I'm going to have Brother Austin in just a minute stand right here in front of the pulpit. We're going to have a song, and we're going to invite you to come down. There's not going to be any hard questions. You don't have to know theology. We won't embarrass you in any way. But somebody will kneel with you. And they'll show you how today you can be saved. Don't leave and be a fool. Come and settle it. And walk out of here and go home and eat lunch. And know that if I die tonight, I know where I'm going. Because I've accepted Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to ask that every head be bowed and every eye closed. 
I'm going to ask our sister just to play very softly just as soon as she gets to the piano. And then in just a minute, our brother is going to sing. And I'm going to have prayer first, and then I'm going to ask him to sing. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking. I want to have a word of prayer. I'd love to pray for you, but you're going to have to let me know. First off, I'm asking for anyone in the building that would say, Brother Kent, I don't know that if I died today that I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure. And Brother Kent, I care about my soul. And I wish you'd pray for me. Now, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up. I'm not going to come and get you. I don't know your name. I won't call your name. But I will pray for you. In fact, every head is bowed, every chin is tucked low. I'm just going to look across the building, just once or twice. And if you'd like me to pray for you, you're not saved, or you're not sure, I'm just going to ask you to just lift your head up and just look at as soon as our eyes meet, you can put your head right back down. But by looking at me, you're saying, Brother Ken, I'm not saved, but I wish you'd pray for me today. Who's like that? I'm looking around the building. I'm looking across the building. Just lift that head and just look at me. When we're done, you can put your head right back down. Just look at me. That's all it'll take. I want to pray for you today. Who's like that? I'm moving across the building. Just lift that hand. Just look at me. I just want to pray for you today. Is there one? Is there one? Say, Brother Ken, I am a Christian. But today, somewhere in the message, God spoke to my heart about something in my life. And I wish you'd pray for me today. How many Christians are like that? Can slip your hand up, hold it high. Yes, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Anyone else? Pray for me, Brother Ken. God spoke to me today. Heavenly Father. We come to you. I didn't see anyone today that looked at me. I pray that everybody in this building is saved. Lord, if there is one here today that doesn't know you, I pray today they'd settle it. This may be their last opportunity. And then, Lord, all across the building, hands went up. You're dealing with hearts about things that only you know. I pray today would be a day of surrender, a day of obeying you. Heavenly Father, we give you this invitation. You take it, you bless it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look up here and listen to me just a minute. 